Welcome everyone. My name is Laura Tamblin Watts. I'm the CEO of CanAge, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. And we're delighted to be bringing to you this pre-election town hall with Rachel Blaney of the NDP. I'm going to be turning to my colleague Darina to introduce herself briefly and the organization and to provide a little bit of a background on Ms. Blaney. Darina? Perfect. Thank you, Laura. So I am Darina Semyonov. I'm AgeWell's Policy and Knowledge Mobilization Manager. Uh, AgeWell is Canada's technology and aging network focused on improving the lives of older adults and their caregivers today and into the future. I'm really pleased to welcome Rachel Blaney, Member of Parliament for North Island Powell River. Nice to see you again, Rachel. And uh, MP Blaney is the New Democratic Party whip former seniors critic and currently a spokesperson for veterans and deputy critic for Indigenous services and Crown Indigenous relations. Of course, we all know Laura Tamblin Watts as the CEO of CanAge, and uh, we are really excited that CanAge is hosting these conversations today. They're extremely important, and I welcome both of you to this fireside chat where we are going to discuss the major issues facing older voters and caregivers during this year's election. A reminder to our viewers that this session is being recorded and will be shared widely with CanAge's national network of members. There are many partners, stakeholders, and others in the aging sector. Back to you, Laura. Thanks very much. And it's a particular pleasure to have Rachel here today, who has been such a passionate advocate for seniors and has taken this issue so deeply to heart. So just by starting off on our first question, I wanted to frame it out that we have a really active membership and network of organizations also passionate. And we've got some fresh numbers to share with you today. 92% of CanAge members agree that the federal government needs to invest more money in long-term care. 94% of CanAge members say that the federal government needs to invest money in home care. And 90% of CanAge members agree that the federal government needs to provide some financial support for things like home modifications. Rachel, this is a near and dear issue to your heart. And we know that the NDP has been thinking about these things very seriously. The leader has been talking a lot, very passionately about seniors care. Maybe could you share for us a little bit of how your party is going to address these issues going forward? And it's so important that we do have this opportunity because we know that the NDP has been really vocal on this. We've had the leader talking a lot about long-term care and home care, and we know that your platform is very robust in this area. So give us a bit of a top line view. What are some of the key points that you want to see moving forward around seniors care in Canada? Well, thank you so much for that question. And thank you as well for hosting this very important conversation. I'm here in Powell River. I'm in the traditional unceded territory of the Tla'am and people. So I just want to acknowledge them and uh, thank them for allowing me to do this important work in, in their communities. Um, you know, for the NDP, this is something that has been startling. And I know that you and I, Laura, uh, Laura sorry, have had a lot of conversations about this, that really what we saw during COVID was the uncovering to many Canadians of what we were already seeing in the background. A lot of resources that were very limited for seniors. We knew that home care was a challenge, a lot of people not being able to access those services. And then long-term care, of course, became something that all of us uh, were traumatized, just envisioning our hearts were with those families. And, you know, I talked to folks that were in the military who served our communities in that fundamental way during that part of the pandemic. And, you know, when you see those folks who've been so highly trained, really traumatized by what they saw, you know that we have to do better. So the NDP is very committed to this. We want to make sure that there's privatization is taken out of long term care because we just don't want to see something where profits matter more than people. And I think, you know, this is something that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, talking about in my own region, uh, but across Canada, about how do we make sure that those services that are there. And I'll probably end up answering this uh, with this answer again and again during this discussion. But one of the things that NDP has been very strong in is we need a comprehensive national senior strategy. We know 
that people are aging in our country. And what I feel frustrated with is the focus is always about workforce development. What are we gonna do when people retire? That is a part of the problem, but it is not the whole problem. We need to make sure that as we see this population age, that we review our processes across Canada, that the federal government does take leadership to look at the broader picture and make sure that we're sharing the best practices from one part of our country to another. And really looking at this in a comprehensive way where it's led by seniors. I mean, the people who are having this experience are the best people to, to guide us in the next steps. And so we need to see that work done because everybody is impacted uh, by what people need in our community. And seniors are just one robust part of that. It just needs to be dealt with in a much more comprehensive and meaningful way. I know that you've been also passionate about aging in place. You're in a beautiful part of the country up island in British Columbia, and it is an aging part of the country as well. You've been very active in initiatives to let people stay in their community in your area. And I know that that passion is something that you've spoken about across this country as well. The Liberals are looking at having a little bit of money to support nonprofits to help people age in place. But we know that the Conservatives are also thinking about tax cuts to help people age in place. Do you speak a little bit about what the NDP thinks is important or what they could do in government to allow people to age in place longer? Well, this is such an important subject, and, and you're absolutely right. In my region, you know, I, I represent a rural and remote communities, and what we're seeing is, you know, younger uh, seniors are being overpriced in the area, the larger centers, so they're moving to the smaller communities. And at the same time, we're seeing seniors in smaller communities being forced because there isn't the resources there, the appropriate amount of housing, healthcare, so forth, to move to the larger centers. But what we're not quantifying, which I think we need to start doing, is that capital that is just in the people you know, your social capital. So I remember talking to one senior who had a partner who was very ill, and whenever he was not doing well, people would drop by with food. People would drop by and sit with him while she went out and did the things she needed to do. And it was just sort of what happened because of the community. But so often people are forced to move, and then they lose all of that community connection and their health outcomes, of course, go down. So this, this system has to stop. So the NDP for one of the things, of course, is we want the national senior strategy so that we can start addressing that, have investment in that so that we actually have actions. Right now we have a liberal uh, government that has a minister of seniors, but that minister has no resources at all. The NDP is committed to making sure that they have some resources so they can at least start making decisions and bringing people together in a more meaningful way. And of course, housing, we've committed to 500,000 units, but our policy and our plan is really about making sure what works for those regions and letting them guide our way. So I think of, you know, for example, in our area, Cortez Island, it's a very, very small island. Well, it's a large, riding, a large island, but, you know, smaller community. But a lot of people who live on that island have big chunks of land and big houses, and that's been their life. But they don't want to leave their community trying to find smaller, affordable housing for them to live in so that they can stay in the community as hard, as hard. And Port Hardy, the same thing. You know, there's a group there that has fundraised a significant amount of money uh, to build seniors housing, but they aren't getting that support from the federal government as well. So we really need to be looking at those health outcomes and be committed to having the resources there to make solutions make sense. But again, I'm sorry to keep going back to it. Until we have that national senior strategy, it's like all of these things keep falling apart because there isn't something comprehensive where we're like, hey, this is how we're going to move together collectively as a country. This is how we're going to work with the territories and with the provinces to make the next steps happen. And this is how we're going to support the people who built our country as they age. Let's pick up on national strategies as a thread. You know, one of the things that we saw missing from a lot of platforms was the issue of dementia. Of course, it's the number one comorbidity. And I've got a question from the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario around that. And they were asking about how you think we need to move forward with dementia. We, as you know, the Liberals, of course, put together a dementia strategy unfunded essentially at this point. And if you look at some of the other party platforms, they're not talking about dementia. I know that this has been an issue that you have thought about a lot. Can you share with me a little bit about your thoughts about how the NDP is thinking about dementia and would they fund a dementia strategy instead of just having a dementia strategy? 
Well, thank you for that question. And I think it's incredibly important. And I know this has been one of the frustrations uh, for me with this, the Ministry of Seniors under the Liberal government. You know, I was an advocate for it. I fought really hard to see that role. And I remember right after uh, the announcement was made, sitting down with the new seniors minister and being like, this is great. So do you have any money? <laughs> do you have like any resources that are yours? And, and she was very honest and I believe a very hardworking person who cares a lot, um, but doesn't have that independence. So the NDP is committed to looking at that. Again, we can't have strategies without any resources to manage it. And we know that the, you know, the seniors population across Canada is growing and we need to adapt to that. And we need to have a plan that makes sense moving forward. And how people are aging is different. I couldn't agree more. Majority of, of seniors do stay home in their homes. Like, I, it's funny, we, we sit down and have these conversations and people are like talking about long-term care all the time. That is such an important issue. We should never minimize that. But we also know that people are staying at home as long as they possibly can, as they would want to. Um, the strategies are harder because families are dispersed in a lot more different ways than they were before. You know, I think of, of myself, I'm very lucky. My mother is in assisted living because of a, a massive stroke. She's close to home. I'm able to support her. But I often think, you know, she just moved to live closer to me uh, when she was retiring. And if she hadn't, what would have happened for her? There's so much support that, that families do. So when it comes to having a, dealing with dementia, I mean, this is something there's so much new research happening. There's so many tools. We need to make sure that we're making sure that people know about those tools and that we're making them as affordable as possible and that we're having the, uh, the depth of understanding of creating those communities so that we're more accessible because they'll never go to waste. I mean, this is the other thing is that, you know, the more that we create this infrastructure, the better it will be for everyone, for everyone. And so I think we need to start looking at it as something that is an asset to our communities and not see this sort of like, oh, those people who have dementia or those families who have to deal with it. It is a community experience and we need to bring it back into that view because everything we do to make anything more accessible is better for everyone. Let's talk about better for everyone. You know, COVID-19 has really given Canadians a way of thinking about vaccinations that we never have before. And I know that you've been passionate as well around the issues of adult vaccinations long before we even had COVID to wrestle with. But one of the pieces that we're really concerned with is making sure that the federal government is playing an appropriate role in adult vaccinations and not just thinking of those COVID as kind of a one-off but understand that there's real health equity questions here as well. And so just to give you a, a bit of information about our most recent survey, 96% of Canadian members agreed that all Canadians should have equal access to vaccines, which we understand to mean free and also easy to get no matter where they live. And 84% of Canadian members agreed the federal government should prioritize vaccinations and increase seniors' vaccines rates for COVID-19 and other vaccine-preventable diseases like influenza, and pneumonia, and shingles. We are heading into flu season. And, you know, I know you're coming from British Columbia, which was, you know, has one of the worst um, vaccine hesitancy rates in the country. We know that it has a very poor, um, has a very poor coverage when it comes to making the uh, adult vaccinations available to people when it comes to things like, you know, other things like pneumonia and so on. I'm wondering if you could just share with us a little bit about how your party will prioritize vaccinations for, well, all Canadians, but older Canadians in particular, to improve vaccination rates and support health equity. Well, this is incredibly important. And honestly, before I started being the spokesperson for seniors for the NDP, I did not know. And I think that that was a good eye opener. So for the NDP, of course, one of our key things is education and having the federal government be an active partner in this. You know, I understand that the distribution of health care is really a provincial and territorial jurisdiction. I understand that. But when we see things starting to fall apart, I think the federal government has to remind itself that this is actually a national program. And that is something as Canadians, we are very proud of that we have a, a healthcare system uh, that is inclusive and universal. And sometimes I think we all need to take a step and, and look at the reality that we're seeing less and less resources 
coming from the federal government to the provinces and territories to deliver that service. So the NDP is absolutely committed to increasing that. If we want a universal Canadian-wide program and support, we absolutely need that. Of course, the other thing that the NDP has been fighting ferociously for is trying to get a national pharmacare program to meet that need. Uh, because when it comes to vaccines and when it just comes to medication, honestly, how many seniors that I speak to who are cutting pills in half because they can't afford it? Um, it depends on the time of year uh, sometimes for people, but it's absolutely heartbreaking when people can't afford their medication and they're in and out of the hospital because they can't afford their medication. So if we're going to stabilize health for everyone, having a pharmacare program where we're all buying collectively to, to lower costs, where we're really making sure that there's support from the federal government to put some money into that is going to make a huge difference. But education is also key. And I think we need to educate not only people, but their healthcare professionals to let them know you're getting to this age. It's now this time for you to start looking at these different type of vaccines and getting serious about it. So we really need to see a federal investment because the long, long term care, it's, it's sort of this discussion of do we want reactive health care or do we want preventative health care? And exactly. I think that is why it's so important to have the education going out to people, but also to the healthcare providers. So they're actually educating people as they age. No, we really think it's important that everyone be covered equitably across this country, regardless of their own personal circumstances and that access and affordability are taken out of the equation. You know, that preventive piece we have learned is going to be the most important piece of all. Of course, we know that frailty comes from things like inflammation influenza and shingles and pneumonia. And if you can keep people healthy and well, that avoids the download health transfers, which we're always talking about, but also keeps economies going. And, and we learned, of course, about that in a sharp consequence of COVID-19 when our economies have shut down. So, you know, vaccines save people, people save economies. And when you're thinking about that holistic opportunity to make sure that everyone stays healthy and well. We really are very grateful for your insights about what the NTP. Let's talk about money a little bit, because one of the things that you are talking about, of course, is that need that many people have to make their dollar go farther. You know, whether it's cutting pills in half or you and I have talked about people making decisions about do I eat or do I have heat? And these are decisions that are really not appropriate in a country which is so wealthy. We're, we're concerned about making our dollar stretch longer, often in times of very low interest rates, and COVID-19 has been a very financially uncertain time as well. And we know that the NDP has been thinking a lot about economic security of everyone as we age, but also about seniors as well. You know, some of the pieces that are at play are for folks who, of course, will never forget the Sears pension uh, falling apart, and also Nortel, and, and many before that, and, and at the moment, more will happen. And, you know, these are deferred wages of hardworking Canadians who have put their, their own earned money into the pension fund, and then they're at the last, at the back of the line, really. So that's one piece that we're concerned about. We're also very concerned about people having more flexibility to make their own dollars. I mean, lots of us will never have a pension and we're steadily trying to put money aside in our SPs and RIFs. But you know, right now we have a mandatory withdrawal starting at 71. And that was maybe fine when it was originally created where people died at 74, but now with at least 10 years more than that, you know, some of these things are outdated. I wonder if I could ask you to speak a little bit to some of the key priorities of the NDP going forward about protecting economic security of Canadians. Well, this question, again, all of the questions are just so important, um, but I couldn't agree more with you, especially around the pensions and the reality that these are deferred wages. And I've worked with people in my writing. Um, you know, I remember having a chat with one man who was in his mid 70s and he had an amazing pension. The company went bankrupt. Bottom of the line, you, you know, that's where pensions are. They're way low. The lawyers are paid. All of the other things are paid. People who put their money, worked hard for the corporation, really at the bottom of the line. And he said, you know, I had a pension, $1,200 a month. It's now $70. So I have to go out and work again. And, and it's like, you know, people plan. They, they work hard. Their plan is their pension. 
and and to have that taken away when you're in your mid 70s and then having to try to figure that out it's really just not fair so the ndp has actually put forward legislation more than once uh, that says we just want to make sure that pensions are at the top of the list it only is fair that people worked hard they put their deferred wages now they need to retire and they need to retire safely and other people's needs should not become be come before those of workers it just doesn't make any sense unfortunately every time we put it forward uh, neither the conservatives or the liberals ever support it and in the last parliament actually uh one of the members from the block picked up the legislation from the ndp modified it a bit and even in committee you know when we were trying to get it through we wanted to get it passed on it before they called an election and they they voted against it and so this is still a big challenge um and when it comes to affordability i think that is another issue that's really important and part of our plan is is quite honestly is to make sure that the wealthiest canadians the top one percent finally finally pay their fair share and i know that sometimes people get afraid and think oh they're all going to leave the country and we're going to have nothing their assets are in our country it's going to be very hard for them to leave and the other thing is we just need to say you have to be fair if every hardworking Canadian in this country is paying their fair share of taxes, we need to make sure that we see those bigger corporations pay their fair share we're not asking for bazillions of dollars we're asking for them to pay their fair share so I think that's important because we do need to make life more affordable we need to have those resources and you know I, I, I just need to say this in closing on this answer is I'm fighting really hard for childcare in this country. And the reason that I am fighting really hard for childcare is because of how many seniors that I work with are women who are the poorest seniors in this country, often do not have a CPP, they have a little OAS and they have a little GIS and that is all they are living on. We need to start looking at these cycles and how they impact women in our country to understand that the senior crisis of women seniors who are extremely poor, struggling profoundly is linked to the same issue that we're having today of childcare and accessible childcare. And I couldn't agree more. And that great status of women report that came out some years ago was really talking about that age of gender and how those two things connect. And of course, as you say, the poorest people in the country in terms of demographics are, well, often there's an indigenous piece to this and well, and inter intersectionality, of course, but it's older women who have not been in the workforce and have taken caregiving supports or taken a more traditional role or who have been widowed, right, or divorced. So people who have been in the workforce uh, the least in some cases are, of course, the most vulnerable. This is especially true as well if they're coming in with sponsorship where you can't qualify often for 40 years for full um, modest amounts anyway, and then even 10 years for partial. So we need to be looking at these things through gender lenses as well as an age lens. That is great. That's going to lead me into a few questions that we have from our colleague organizations who have been working really hard to advance the rights and well-being of, of Canadians. I know that you and I have talked a lot about elder abuse over the years, and this question comes from the Canadian Network for the prevention of elder abuse, which has, of course, its head offices out on the West Coast, where you are joining us from today. A bit of a, a frame out, 91% of Canadian CanAge members think that raising awareness of elder abuse should be a priority for the federal government. And 89% of CanAge members agreed the federal government should dedicate specific funding to programs that prevent and respond to elder abuse. So the CNPA's question is this, from the scandal of senior neglect and abandonment in long-term care to ever-increasing reports of elder abuse in the community, older Canadians have been dramatically affected and victimized during the pandemic. What steps do you plan to take to strengthen prevention and foster a national response to elder abuse? Well, I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to go back to the national senior strategy. I mean, this is what I keep advocating for, because these are the key issues that we need to be bringing all provinces and territories together on and making sure that we all have strategies that correlate with one another and, and have that investment, have the federal government step up and be part of the solution. So that's something the NDP is passionate about. You know, I've dealt with so many people that have walked into my office that are elderly who have been totally taken advantage of uh, by people that they've met. Um, you know, I was recently talking to one elderly woman who was really stuck in her house and somebody was coming to help her out and taking her bank card to buy things for her and it didn't end well. And so we need to make sure there's systems in place um, where 
there, these issues are caught before they become long-term issues. You know, we had one, uh, a bank call us not too long ago uh, because they had a beautiful elderly woman who had been called by CRA to go buy iTunes card. And she had already spent several thousand dollars and was actually moving money out of her rift to go buy $3,000 more. And thank goodness. But we, so, it, you know, when we look at these solutions, we need to have more education so that we have the indicators. We need to make sure that there's processes where people, where seniors are sort of checked in. in. You know, I think of some of the other countries, there's one, the, 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 male lady experience where they just knock on the door and give the mail to the seniors to make yeah. sure there's just somebody sort of connecting with them. We start, we need to start looking at these issues because the reality is as seniors travel, as communities and families change, we don't have the same systems in place that we used to have where you're, you're living with your child as you age or you're, you know, all these things. So the vulnerability increases. So we need serious investment. We need to look at the plethora of the realities that people are facing. We need to have education because as the world changes, like I think of that old woman, older woman buying those iTunes. She's just like, everything is changing in terms Absolutely. of Absolutely. So quickly. I thought that was the way it was. And so that is so important because we're seeing people fall through the gaps and they don't get their money back. Yeah. And for some of these people, that $3,000 is a huge difference and may change their lives fundamentally. So we need those places. And then, of course, there's the physical violence. There's so many realities. And I've heard far too many. And I, I know the, this audience has as well. So we need to make sure that there's, there's that system in place to start addressing these issues. And really, we need to make sure that the federal government is part of it because the provinces are doing the best they can in some cases, in some cases they could be doing better, but sometimes it is a resource issue. And if seniors are valued and they should be in our country, there needs to be the resources to support that. And just to close, I wanted to wrap up that, you know, your party has said that they're strongly supporting a number of UN conventions, people with disabilities and Indigenous, and you've also said how important it is that we think about a UN convention on the rights of older persons, and we really appreciate that as we're trying to rally the United Nations in that area. And you've also had a strong emphasis around aging in place, and I see that in your platform, you've got tax credits and caregiver credits for aging at home and home modifications, and that you've been really supportive of investing in rural technologies and other technologies in the age tech sector to make sure that people can age in place and, and stay closely connected as well. And that's really important. I'm going to invite to the stage our closing, which is Gregor Snedden. And Gregor Snedden, I'll invite you to turn your camera on and, and pop over. Gregor runs Help Age Canada, which, as you know, is a wonderful organization that works to support the, the betterment of Canadians here. So, Gregor, I'll just invite you to turn your camera on and join us to the stage. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. I, I can't seem to uh, turn it on because uh, I think it's someone on your end needs to turn my camera on, but uh, uh, oh, here we go. Okay. There we go. There we go. Thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Rachel, for, uh, for an excellent conversation and really highlighting uh, your platform. And it's really exciting to, uh, to hear that investment and really the passion that you carry on this issue, which is obviously so important to, to all of us. So thank you so much. And, and also thank you to CanAge, to Laura and her team for facilitating this kind of event, this opportunity to really hear um, uh, from, the, uh, from the various candidates uh, about these issues. So thank you so much. Uh, can age, but ultimately, you know, it's in our hands. So for all of us who are viewing and participating, we need to get out there and vote. And I, I just really encourage everybody to do that, to, to listen with your ears and your, your, the, the ears of your heart and to uh, really make the move because uh, Help Age can convene these events, but we're the ones that have to put into action. And, and uh, so I just encourage everybody to vote. Thanks very much, Gregor. And so, Rachel, as people are heading to the polls, a quick reminder, of course, that there's many ways that you can vote. And we have great information. If you're looking for more details, go to canage.ca slash election 21. We have detailed all of the party platforms, of course, including the NDP's platform there. So you can have a chance to compare. I think you'll see that the NDP platform is extremely robust. And we know that that has a lot to do with you and the passion and integrity 
and work that you have done tirelessly on behalf of Canadians, especially older Canadians, veterans and our Indigenous populations. It's just a pleasure to have you with us today. Again, Monday is the day to vote. So if you need to know how you can vote or double check that you're voting correctly, canh.ca slash election 21. There's also a webinar from Elections Canada that you can watch as well as a voter toolkit so you can make sure that you're doing it in the right way. And with that, we'll thank you, Rachel, let you get back to your hard work. And on behalf of all Canadians, we thank you for your dedication to older adults issues. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.